If you have your Bible, you're going to turn into Proverbs uh, chapter 13. We're going to look at one verse this morning, and uh, from there, that's going to kind of launch us into some other verses as we, uh, we talk, uh, have our conversation this morning. Proverbs in the Old Testament, um, get to Psalms, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, it's kind of right in the middle. If you, if you uh, read your Bible, or when you read your Bible, uh, you probably should go to Proverbs and at least read a chapter or a few verses every day from Proverbs, because it is a book filled with wisdom. Um, and, and so it, it's a powerful book, and if it's not a part of your daily reading, it, you probably should include it. But we're, that's where we're going to be. And so today, we are in week three. This is a four-part series. Um, Brother Chad's going to close us out next week, and then the following Sunday after that, we're actually going to kick off our, our journey towards Easter. Uh, and so that's going to that's be a powerful series. I hope you'll be there uh, for, for all of those. But uh, we're in week three of Blueprints. As you can see up on the screens, uh, building a godly character. And so this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at our friendships. Um, and not just our friendships. And I don't want you to think, okay, hey, that's, that's a buddy I know at work. Or, you know, every now and then we'll, we'll have lunch together. But I'm talking about when I say friendships, I want you to think inner circle. And these are the people that, that, that are the closest to you. Now, this may come as a shock to you. And I say that a little sarcastically. But the people that are closest to you will have the greatest impact and influence on you, okay? The, the, the people that are closest to you are going to have the greatest influence and greatest impact on you. And there's no real big secret as to why. The people that are closest to you are the ones that you likely spend the most time with, um, people that you talk to the most, people that you listen to the most. And, and usually, your, your inner circle are the ones who you are seeking their advice or, or getting input and wisdom from them. And, and so listen to this quote. It says, we become the combined average of the five people that we hang around the most. The five people. Now, now I know for a lot of you, you're kind of already getting that five going, one, two, okay, do I, like, do I like that average? A lot of spouses started thinking about their spouse's closest five friends and saying, do I like that average? If you have teenagers, you're probably thinking about, okay, what about their friends and da-da-da-da. And, and I was thinking about mine. Uh, people that I hang out with the most that are kind of in my circle, and, and that would, you know, honestly, here at church, that would probably be Brother Chad and, and, and uh, Jeff Mize, maybe Roger Taff, and then, then one, that's, one that scared me was Russ Ramsey, and so uh, I might need to push him out of my inner circle. I'm just kidding. Russ is a good guy, and uh, he's a good friend of mine. His name is really Russ, but I call him Russ. That's how close we are. But you, you think about that. We, the, the question is, if we become the average of the five people that we're closest to, then do I like that average? Do I like what that looks like? Now, before we go any further, I want to make sure that I want to make something clear. This conversation we're having this morning is not about staying away from people who don't call themselves believers in Christ. Now, so if you came into this room today and you're not sure about this whole God thing or church thing, and you walked in and sat down and you go, great, the guy up there with a the microphone is going to tell people to not hang out with me. No, that's not at all what I'm saying. First of all, we're glad you're here. First, glad that you came in. And we're, as believers in Christ, we're not about pulling away from people who don't know Christ. But what we're talking about is the people who, are, who have the greatest influence on us, people that are in our circle. And you know what? After our time here today, um, after you evaluate people in your inner circle, there may, you may decide that there are some people who might not need to be in there, might not need to be that close. But here's something else I want you to think about. Are you someone that others are thinking about? Maybe, evalu maybe they're evaluating whether you should or shouldn't be in their inner circle because it goes both ways. There are people in our lives that we need in our inner circle, and there are people that, are, that if we're honest, maybe they don't need to be a part of that inner circle. And there is the possibility that someone is saying, yes, they need you in their inner circle, but they may also be thinking, wow, do, am I sure that I need them? And here's the main idea for this morning. What do you, who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? What type of husband? What type of wife um, do you want to be? What type of parent do you want to be? What type of employee, employer? What type of uh, friend do you want to be? What type of neighbor do you want to be? What type of student? Uh, what type of single adult, what type of, what type of relationships do you want to have? Who do you want to be? Because who you become will be greatly determined by who will be closest to you. 
And I found this quote, I was just kind of researching for this sermon, and I was reading a lot of different articles, and I read this one. This, this was from a, a, a leadership magazine, and it said this. It says, when it comes to cultivating an inner circle of relationships that fuel your success, the essential context for those you cultivate must be based on the future that you want. You guys that? That must be based on the future that you want. Basically, that's a, that's a fancy way of saying what do you want to become, then you better find people that are going to help you become that. It's Stephen Covey's, one of his uh, seven habits of highly effective people. It's begin with the end in mind. It's like, who do you want to become? What do you want to be? Think of that and then ask yourself, are my relationships, my inner circle, is it helping me to become that? And now, guess who has a lot to say about our inner circle, about our, our relationships? God. Yeah. Of course, you're in church. That's exactly what I'm going to say. But he does. He does. He's given us a wealth of wisdom on friendships and relationships. And we're going to look at several of those, again, like I said this morning. But I want to focus on, on this particular one in Proverbs 13, 20. And it says this. It says, The one who walks with the wise will become wise. But a companion of fools will suffer harm. So if, you don't, if you're a person that writes in your Bible, you probably want to underline that one, highlight it, star it, you know, put a bunch of arrows to it. But the one who walks with the wise will become wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. And that last line, it, 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 when I first, when you start looking at that and thinking about that verse, it, it, says, it says the companion of fools will suffer harm. It doesn't say that the fool will suffer harm. Now, I don't know why it doesn't say that. Maybe, maybe it's just implied because they're foolish, and so there's going to be foolish things that happen to them. But it doesn't say that. It says the companion of the fool will suffer harm. The fool's influence, their actions, their words, um, their choices, they not only impact their world, but they have a huge and powerful impact on our world too. Now, I'm not saying we can blame our choices on the foolish person, on these relationships that that's uh, our the responsibility is ours but the impact that someone who is close to us their influence on us is powerful that's undeniable it stands to reason that we need to make sure that we don't have any fools in our inner circle and we need to make sure that we're not the fools in someone's inner circle so this morning what we're going to do is we're going to have a, a, a dtr does anyone know what a dtr is yeah, some of you do. Some of our younger crowd does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, a DTR is kind of a, a define the relationship. It's a talk that you usually have maybe when you're dating or you're seriously dating. And, and you kind of just say, okay, we need to figure out, okay, where, what, are we, what are we doing? We got to define where is this headed? Because I like you, you like me. Is this, are, are we going somewhere with this? Are, are we going to get serious in this? Or or it's just one of us really serious and the other one's, ah, or maybe things aren't going so well, so we have to kind of have a stop and just say, hey, wait a minute, things need to change. We need to stop here and we need to have a talk. There's some questions we need to ask and we need to get answered before we figure out where we're going in this relationship. And so I, I think it's, it's important that uh, as believers, we have these DTR talks with ourselves, but also with the Lord and kind of ask some important questions about the relationships that help define our relationships or, or we're constantly redefining our relationships so that we know that these people are helping us to build godly character. Where am I and where do I want to go? And are the people closest to me helping me to get to where God wants me to be? Now, I, I want to tell you this. If your closest relationships aren't helping you to be closer to God, then you need to distance yourself a little bit from them so that you don't start distancing yourself from God. Catch that? If your closest relationships aren't helping you get closer to God, then you need to distance yourself a little bit from them so that you don't start distancing yourself from God. So let's ask these, these four DTR, these define the relationship questions that help us define if the people that are closest to us are helping or hurting. And remember to ask these questions of yourself too. Are you hurting or helping? And here's the first one. In your relationships, and when I say relationships, think inner circle. In your inner circle, is there a healthy balance of leading and following? And the key word there is influence. Now, we've, we've said this over and over, but, but these relationships have so much influence on us. Proverbs 22, 24 through 25 says, Don't make friends with an angry person, and don't be a companion of a hot-tempered one. Why? Because... It says, or you will learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. 
Proverbs 6, 27 says, Can a man, and this is funny, can a man hold fire against his chest without burning his clothes? Now, the bottom line, as I said earlier, is our closest relationships are going to have a major influence on us. And that, that last scripture basically says, if you're going to play with fire, guess what? You're going to get burned. And the goal is to have a, a, a two-way relationship where there is give and take. Influence goes both ways, and you're, you're learning from them, and, and you want them to be learning from you. Now, I, I get that there are different types. Like, there's a mentor relationship where you're doing most of the learning because this mentor is, you know, is just kind of pouring into you. But I'm, again, talking about your, your inner circle. And you have to kind of throw up this big red caution flag if, if the, all the influencing is just one way. Like they're leading you and they have no desire to, to really listen to you or to be led by you. Because those types of friendships, can, they can become exhausting, but they can also become super dangerous because you can find yourself in a position where your voice isn't valued or doesn't matter. And so what happens is you're, you're just kind of, you're kind of along for the ride. And they're kind of dictating, someone in your inner circle is just kind of dictating where everything goes. Now we have a... Uh, we have a dog, and his name is Landry. How many of you have dogs? Raise your hand. How many of you have cats? Okay. We have dogs. We're, we're, well, I say dogs. We have a dog. We're, we're dog people. Um, and so he's, his name is Landry. He's named after the great Tom Landry, former Dallas Cowboys coach. Uh, we wanted to name, the boys and I wanted to name him Dez, but Shonda didn't want to see the dog throwing up the X everywhere he went. So we, we went with Landry. Um, and so and um, I, I don't know about all dogs, but I'm just assuming uh, based on ours that, that he, most dogs enjoy riding in the car. Now, you may have one that, that, that doesn't do that, but ours does. And, and Landry is, I don't, I don't know where, where he gets, uh, you know, I don't know if he's a Jedi or what he is, but there are times that he knows when he can ride with us, and there are times where he knows it's not an option. Like this morning when, when everyone's leaving for church, um, like when my family's leaving, he doesn't come to the door. He kind of just stays off over there by the kitchen because he knows somehow in his doggy brain he knows that he can't come where we're going. But there are other times where he, get, he goes to the garage door. Like sometimes when we take uh, Catherine to school, uh, maybe if it's, it's cold or rainy or something, um, and, but he knows that's, and, and I, again, he's a Jedi, but he, he knows that he can get there. And so he jumps in the car. Uh, if we let him, he'll jump in the car, crack the window a little bit and sticks his head out and you know, pulls out the tongue and it's just happy as can be. But here's the thing that, that, I've always, that I've never heard. This is the thing that I don't get with Landry. Landry never, ever asks, where are we going? He never asked me that question. He never asked Shonda. He doesn't ask me. He doesn't ask any of the kids. He never asked, hey, where are we going? Because we could be taking him out into the country just to kick him out and leave him. I mean, we could be taking him out to, uh, on a blind date with another dog. I mean, we could be taking him anywhere. But you know, he doesn't ask. He just gets in and he's just as happy as can be riding to who knows where. And I say that because I think we have to be careful when it comes to our inner circle that we're not like a bunch of just dogs who are just happy to be along for the ride. I mean, you saw it in Proverbs twenty two twenty five. You will learn his ways or her ways and then entangle yourself in a snare. So their influence has power on us and if left unchecked, could lead us down a path where we don't need to be or where we don't really want to be. The second question we have to ask ourselves, uh, a, a DTR question, is in our inner circles, in our relationships, can we ask each other the hard questions? And this has everything to do, the key word there is, is accountability. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And Hebrews 10, 24 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Your inner circle should be uh, able to lovingly, let me emphasize lovingly, your inner circle should be able to lovingly call you on the carpet. Running from accountability is running from truth and running from life change. And you know what, you know what good leaders, people who, who, do, who are successful in their jobs or successful in their industries or, or you know, running companies or, or just successful in whatever, you know what, what these leaders have in common is they don't want yes men or yes women around them. They don't want that. 
What they want is they, they want people who are going to challenge them. They want people who are going to ask the tough questions to give input. Why? Because the leader understands that to be better, to improve, um, to, to, to succeed, there has to be other eyeballs and other minds that are looking at what's going on to make sure that they're not missing anything. And whatever, whatever area or what, whatever thing you're talking about, a good leader knows I don't need yes men or yes women. I need people who are going to ask the tough questions, who are going to look at it and, and make sure that, that we're not missing anything. Because you are, you are, you are sorely mistaken if, to think that you don't have any blind spots in your life, <clears throat> excuse me, or in your character. Your inner, your inner circle needs to be your blind spot detection. Some of your cars may have this now. Some of the newer ones where, you know, there's a car coming up next to you and it starts beeping just to let you know there's something over there before you change lanes or before you make this turn. You need to know that there's something there that you're not able to see just yet. And so our inner circle needs to be able to, to be that blind spot detection for us. You don't need the influencers in your life to just be yes people. You need them to be truth tellers who wrap that truth up in love. And a key part of that accountability is giving people, giving your inner circle their permission to ask you those tough questions. In order to be effective in marriage or parenting or in our jobs, our friendships, our decisions, we have to be willing to invite the input of others so we can avoid those landmines in life. And that's part of, that's part of the whole idea of bearing one another's burdens. As you share that burden with, with your friends and you ask them to help you to do the heavy lifting and also to point out places in your life where you're not seeing what you need to see or maybe you're not seeing because you don't want to see it. Now, accountability, it's not, it's not easy. It can be awkward. It can, it can make you angry and upset sometimes. But usually the reason you feel angry or upset is because most of the time the person sharing with you is right about it and you know it. And I'm... I'm sort of guilty of that one. Like I, I, I invite accountability in, but sometimes I don't want <laughs> to hear it because I know what they're saying is right and I know what they're saying is going to mean that there's change, but those are the people that I need in my inner circle. And here's something that should be obvious to you, but I'm going to say it anyway, and it's this. The people in your inner circle, your accountability system, they need to be people who are wanting to help you to be the person that God wants you to be. Not what culture says you should be, not what they think you should do to be successful, not even your own selfish desires, what you want to be successful. Again, we're not asking for yes men, yes women in our inner circle, but we're asking for people who are, who are wanting to point us to God. And I say this, I, a great example of this is when I talk to couples who are, you know, who are married or thinking about getting married, seriously dating or engaged. I, I tell them, I said, your, your closest married friends or your couple friends need to be people who value marriage like you value marriage. Because if you don't, then you're going to get friends who give you, give you just goofy advice to say, well, if he isn't doing what you should do, well, then, you know, leave him or leave her. She should, she's there to serve you or he's there to take care of all your, you know, and they don't give godly advice. And you should avoid having close friends who, who care more about you as individuals than they do as, as the couple. Because the relationship, that is the main thing. And you want a couple of friends who are going to point you to that and not try to pull you apart. And the same things in our inner circles. We want people to help us point us to God and not pull us away from God. And so we need to examine our inner circle and say, can, can we ask each other the tough questions? Which leads us to our, our next question. In your relationship, in those inner circles, do you lose interest in what is right? Keyword there, wisdom. What kind of wisdom are you getting from these friends? Or when you're around these friends, does all of a sudden godly wisdom doesn't matter anymore? 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. What does it mean to be misled? means don't fall for it. Don't fall for the lie. Don't, don't fall into this trap. Don't go that way. What you, do not be misled. So let, let me say this. Don't do this. And here's what you, don't, you need to understand. Here's the truth. Here's, here's the message. Good, bad company corrupts good character. Now the context of that verse, if you're reading uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is warning the church in Corinth about those who are teaching that there is no resurrection. And so that 
they were a threat to the testimony of the church and they were a threat to the gospel. And he's actually quoting, Paul's quoting a, a Greek poet here. Um, and, and he takes the quote and he applies it to the context of warning against falling victim to the false teachings that were trying to infiltrate the church. And the idea is that if you start to associate with them on an intimate level, and by intimate, I mean sitting under their teaching, allowing them to have influence in your life, allowing them to have, to have input, then it's going to corrupt what God is trying to do through the truth of the gospel. Now, are, are, are there people in your life, I wonder, in your inner circle, that when you're around them, you, you kind of remove the Jesus filter from your heart and you just lay it to the side? It's almost like you become someone different when you're around uh, this group of guys or when you're around this, this group of, of ladies. It's as if your, your normal filter uh, for what is right and wrong just kind of gets left, left at home. Uh, and, and it seems to not matter anymore. Wisdom is, godly wisdom is no longer a priority, and so you, you, do, you do dumb stuff or you put yourself in situations that you, you know I just shouldn't, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't be here. You say things that you would never say at home or around your family or, or around other people. You do things that you would never do with other friends or act a certain way that you would never act like in other situations. And you have to ask yourself, why, why is that? Why is that? Why do I become a different person when I'm with fill in that blank? When I'm with this person in my inner circle, why, why, do I, why do I become someone different? Why do, you have to, why do you hide that part from everyone else? Which one, is, which one is, is the real you? Is that really you or is that the you that you become so you can feel like you fit in or feel like you can be a part? And I know this sounds real teenager-y, but this is very adult-like too, where you try to become something so that you feel like you fit in. You, feel, you want this person close to you. You want this inner circle and so you, you, you just kind of become something else so you can have them. And let me say this. If you have to become something you're not in order to be with a friend or have this group of friends in your inner circle, then you have to ask yourself, why are they so important to me that I'm willing to change who I am? And let me, get just, let me dig just a little bit deeper here in, into your business and then I'll back off. If your inner circle's idea of wisdom is something other than God's idea of wisdom, then they're foolish, and so are you. So we've already established the power that, that our inner circle can have on us, so why in the world would you want to surround yourself with people who have no interest in the things of God or your pursuit of God? Now again, I realize you, where you live life you're, you're associating with, you're doing business with, you're around people who, who aren't believers in Christ. And I'm, again, I'm not saying avoid that world, Just drop into your own little holy cocoon. I'm not saying that. But again, we're talking about our inner circle. And you have every, you have all the control on who is in your inner circle, who is influencing you, who you allow to be in there. Psalm 1, uh, the first three verses there say, how happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Now that word happy there, it means, it means blessed. Kind of, if you know um, your Bible, the, um, the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, it's, it's, it's uh, translated happy. And in the original, the word there in, in, in the Hebrew, it, it's actually plural. So you, you would read it, it would say, many are the blessings. Many are the blessings of the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked. Many are the blessings of those who do not stand in the pathway of sinners. Many are the blessings of those who do not sit in the company of mockers. But I want you to notice something. The happiness or the blessings, it's not just about one thing, not just about kind of disassociating yourself from the, the, uh, from the wicked, from the sinners, from the mockers, but it's also about gravitating towards God and, and associating, associating yourself with Him and devotion to God. Uh, it, it's both. And it's interesting to note that the word mocker there, it's translated, it means there's no regard for God. 
It's no regard for God. Do you, have, do you have any of those people in your inner circle who have your ear, who you listen to? Again, the other question, are you one of those? Wisdom says they shouldn't be in your inner circle because they will have an, a powerful influence on you. Again, not saying you can't be friends. It's about the inner circle and the place where you are most... This is the part. Your inner circle is the place where you are most vulnerable and most open to influence. And this is going to lead us to, to the last question this morning, which is, we've covered a little bit already, but in your relationships, in that inner circle, is your faith important to those closest to you? Is your faith important to them? And that key word there is encouragement. Are they encouraging you towards God? We said that earlier with the children in the children's sermon. Are they helping you, encouraging you to move forward, cheering you on towards the things of God, towards being a godly man, towards being a godly woman? 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says, Don't become partners with those who do not believe. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? You notice those, those comparisons there? They're, they're opposites. Righteousness, godliness versus lawlessness. Light dark and so what what it's saying is that those those things are are opposite the words the word become partners with it's it's in the greek and it's it's in the verb tense it's in the present imperative and what that means is paul's not warning the corinthians there about a potential danger saying uh do not start this that's it's a little bit of what he's saying but but that verb tense means that he's he's telling them stop an action that's already in progress so he's, he's saying you, you need to not be in partnership. That partnership needs, needs to end. Them in your inner circle is not healthy for you as a follower of Christ. Now again, he's not saying all, all, any and all associations with unbelievers should be cut off, but he's, he's warning against forming close attachments. In other translations in your Bible, uh, it may have said, uh, don't be unequally yoked. That's often a... a, a thing we talk about in, in dating relationships and marriage that, that you know there's a warning against a believer marrying a person who doesn't believe in God uh, but I, I, in this context we're talking about it's, it's the same with, within our inner circle and that unequally yoked it's, it's an agricultural metaphor and some of you know this you've grown up in church and you've heard this and some of you may never have but a yoke it's, it's just this wooden bar that joins two animals uh, typically they, they were oxen to each other uh, and, and they were connected to each other and connected to whatever the burden was that they were pulling. Uh, a lot of cases, you know, they were pulling some type of plow to, uh, to uh, begin to, to plant seed. Uh, and an un unequally yoked team has one stronger ox and one weaker ox, or maybe one taller ox and one, and one shorter. So they're not, they're not the same. They're not equal. One is stronger, one is bigger. And the weaker or the shorter ox, the one that, that, that is not as strong, it walks slowly. And so the, the work that the, the, the bigger oxen is doing, is it's, it's not equal. This, this ox, oxen has more burden to pull. And what happens is it just causes whatever burden they're pulling together, it just causes it to, to go in a circle. It's not making progress. It just kind of keeps just turning on itself because the weaker one is not equal with the stronger one. So when oxen are unequally yoked, they cannot perform the task that's set before them. Instead of working together, what, what happens? They're, they're working actually against one another. One is pulling this way, the other is pulling this way. And so unequally yoked, it doesn't work. It doesn't work on the farm. And it's not, it doesn't work in relationships either. Because at our very core, a believer and a non-believer are really pulling at two different directions. It doesn't mean that you don't have a lot of similarities. It doesn't mean that you don't have a lot of the same likes. It doesn't mean you don't have a lot of the same interests. But at the very core, about what you believe as what is right and what is wrong, what you believe about truth, what you believe about God, it's different. And so what happens is, ultimately, is you're pulling in different directions. And sadly, in a lot of relationships, what happens is the believer will submit to the non-believer to try to make things equal again. And that's not what God calls us to do. And that's not what God wants 
in our inner circle. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, So encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are already doing. So back, back to that main question that we said earlier. What do you want to be? Or I guess we should say it this way. What does, what does God want you to be? Who does he want me to be? How does he want me to live? How does he want me to treat others? How does he want me to treat my family? What kind of friend does he want me to be? What kind of uh, employee, employer does he want me to be? What kind of church member does he want me to be? What kind of husband, wife, father, single adult, young adult, older adult, teenager? What does he want me to be? As followers of Christ, our faith should be the utmost of importance to us. And we should, we should be doing things that help us to become closer to God. And it means that our inner circle should be filled with people who want the same for us. Who want us to grow closer to God. Chad said it, our, our pastor said it last week, on any given day or any given moment, every one of us is determining our character or we're living it out. And it's so important that we have the right people around us to influence us towards godly character and are helping us to live out that character. And don't forget, too, you have to ask yourself this question. Am I, being in so-and-so's inner circle, am I helping him or am I helping her to be the person that God wants me to be? Because if I'm not then maybe I need to kind of remove myself from that inner circle or start changing what I'm doing in that relationship. And I said this at the beginning too, you may, looking at these four questions, you may have to evaluate some of the people in your inner circle. And again, it's not about, it's not, about not being their friends, but it's like, I can't let this voice be as influential to me as it has been because we are pulling in opposite directions. Because everything about so much of our character is built upon uh, and, and influenced by the people that are closest to us. And so that's a, that's, a, that's a hard question that we have to ask this morning. Are the people that are in my inner circle helping me to be what God wants me to be? Me, as so-and-so's in so-and-so circle, am I helping them? And evaluate and say, what needs to be different? What needs to change? God, give me the strength and the wisdom to know what to do and how to fix that and how to change that.